I'm just going to sing the reigns of Castamere. And who are you, the proud Lord said, that I must bow so low? Only a cat of a different coat. It's all the truth I know. A coat of gold and a coat of red. A lion still has claws. But mine are long and sharp, my lord. As long and sharp as yours. Okay, where are we? Okay, Dr. Winters. And so he spoke. And so he spoke. Oh, cool. It did pop up in my little I'm coming. I'm here. I'm here. I'm Hi. here. Hi, Christy. How are Hello. you? Oh, I'm doing really well. And you have a beautiful singing voice. Thank you. I was just going to be happy to sit in the audience and listen to you do a, a beautiful rendition of the Reigns of Castamere. So thank, thank you for that. You're welcome. Thank you so much for coming. I'm so excited. I have no idea where my to... is. Yeah, well, this is we've had problems with the New Zealand lads before. They, uh, it's it's just a time zone thing, but then they're also just a bit shit. <laughs> in, in, in a loving, in a loving way, oh, right? Yeah, yeah. Same. I, I, I totally get it because I'm like twelve hours. What I, I I spent like two hours with my boyfriend trying to figure out like, okay, well, what time? If it's eight o'clock in Berlin, what time is it at all? Like we went. It is hard. It's hard to organizing this stuff. Right? Yeah, that's why. Uh, yeah. So. Well, Oh, go, yes. go ahead, babe. No, no, no. Well, I, I just, uh, just quickly tagged uh, Michael into that in case he sees it. And okay, uh, sure. I was trying to do Tim, too, but uh, I couldn't get him to tag for some reason. But screw the guys. Right. We can have a chat. Right. Well, <laughs> we're, we're just going to have to Daenerys this one, all right? It's just going to be you and me. <laughs> hey, that's not a problem. Right. <laughs> we can do it. Get some dragons. Yeah, so, so go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to ask you, like, just in terms of... Uh, your history with the show. When did you get into it? Why did you get into it? Um, what do you love? What do you hate about it? I'm just kind of curious myself. So, Oh, sure. Um, I got into the show right around season three. One of my favorite podcasts um, had been doing it and I had just been kind of enjoying them talking about it, not really knowing much about it. And I said, you know, I should probably start watching the show. So I stopped the podcast so I could, you know, kind of binge on it. And I fell in love. The moment I fell in love is kind of odd because it was the moment that Ned Stark gets the book that is the lineages of the great and minor houses. And I found that the binding was period appropriate. And I said, they've got this down. They know what they're doing. I love this. I, I really love the historical references that Game of Thrones drops. Um, for example, the the thins, uh, they do a form of face cutting as tribal delineation that is done in West Africa, um, particularly in Nigeria, uh, Nigeria or um, Cote de la Ivra. Um, and it's also done in East Africa. There are all kinds of references to um, medieval um, Japan and China. And I just, I, I, I really love history. So I totally get off on that. Um, I, I love the show. I love the focus. I love medieval history, particularly medieval England. So this is like right up my alley. Um, sure. And I love the female focus. You know, in, in most historical dramas, the focus is on Henry Tudor and not on Margaret Beaufort. So I really enjoy seeing Daenerys and Cersei and Sansa and Arya and all the female characters and Missandei take that, take those roles on and um, see what the female kind of perspective, how they would deal with being rulers, with being the second in command um, in a universe that is pretty much misogynist. Um, I, I love it. You know, I can't, I, I, I just love it. I can't, that's yeah. about all I can say. But you tell me, tell me how you got into it. Well, I, I don't, I don't have very strong memories. I think it was because of the show coming out and season one. So I saw season one and then decided I wanted to read the books. And I think it was a combination of the show came out, but then um, I was, I still was leaving. I was just leaving the UK, and in the UK, their iTunes 
thing. They had this thing called the 12 days of Christmas where mm -hmm. for 12 days, I don't know if they do it in the U S or other places, but I knew for sure they did it in the UK. And for every day you get like one kind of special thing, you know, it might okay. be a game for free or a, a song for free or a video for free or whatever. And you just get 12 days of like gifts, which is cool. Um, so right. one of the things on there, I'm pretty sure was like, uh, this, the book for like, either an excerpt of it for, or it's for 99 cents or something dead cheap. And then I um, read through the first book and then the next book was like one ninety nine, and then there was a special, you know, and then there was two ninety nine for the third book and then it was four ninety nine, then it was nine ninety. <laughs> so it was like, you know, drugs, you know, like the first right? one free and then you just, they keep getting asking for more and more. And um, I ended up like skipping most of the first book cause I'd seen the first season, but yeah. jumping into the second book, obviously I had then the characters more from, the TV show in mind. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, it was easy to just kind of keep going with the world. I'm very much the same. I am a big fan of um, medieval English history and especially, well, I mean, the Tudors, they're just very fun to study. Um, the Plantagenets yeah. too, but the War of the Roses, or as they knew it in their time, as you'll know, the Cousins War. Right. Was It was the, as you mentioned, you know, Margaret Beaufort was an incredibly powerful and influential um, mover and shaker and she was doing it behind the scenes with you know Elizabeth the the widowed queen of of Edward um, right. after he died and then there was also Margaret of Anjou who was was working you know trying to negotiate things with um with Warwick behind um, Edward's yeah. back in order to get back on the throne and and so because it was a family inter family conflict, women had an opportunity not only to scheme, but also to play peacemaker right. and to work behind the scenes. And obviously in that world, women couldn't hold power in their own right. So there was a lot of motivation, <clears throat> as in Margaret Beaufort's case, to work on behalf of your son or Margaret of Anjou um, or even Elizabeth with her boys that died in the towers, the yeah. princes in the tower. So yeah, and the and the and there's very much that kind of role for women in Game of Thrones, because as you said, it is, you know, it's sort of family battles and, and everybody's related and knows everybody and the history goes very deep and, and there's yeah. a lot of, you know, feuds and stuff in the storyline. So it was interesting. I mean, I, I've watched now as the characters have emerged and women, women's characters have stepped up more and more in a lot of ways because the men just keep killing each other off. Right. <laughs> clear the field and the lady step and complain. thank you very much it's right? much easier I, i'll take now. that power thanks jamie <laughs> yes, yeah um but as you mentioned there's a lot of ways that the game of thrones storyline explores the ways that women can wield some limited power within a very patriarchal system because it is clearly i mean it's a it's a sword and sorcery kind of thing so it's all about knights and battles and who can bash who over the head hardest right. uh, but it's also a political game of who can last and right. that's where uh, because of their not being taken out to the fields although obviously brienne of tarth is a massive sort of exception to the rule on that which Definitely. is she takes up an interesting position. Um, yeah, women are increasingly now, as we're coming toward what we call the end of the story, Sansa stepping up, Cersei stepping up, Daenerys is stepping up, Melisandre is stepping up. Right. Uh, yeah, and so it is very interesting to kind of see he who laughs last laughs best. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I totally agree. I think that the what I find the most interesting is kind of Cersei and the way that she attempts to wield power and Daenerys. Um, mm. I, I love, I, part of me really loves Cersei because she's really, she, she totally hates the system that she wor has to work within, but she kind of uh, concedes that she's not quite, quite smart enough to subvert that system. Right. In in the same way, Daenerys sort of has to give up the, the, the traditional realms of power when she loses her child and is kind of unable to have other children. So she's not able to um, she's not able to use her children as a source of power in the right. same way that Cersei is. Right. And I I 
admire Daenerys for that. I admire her for trying to take on power in her own right and saying, you know what, Viserys is not a good ruler. He's never going to be a good ruler. Um, I have to make the decision now. In fact, I argued with my boyfriend for about an hour and a half because he was like, well, you know, Khal Drogo and his blood riders killed Viserys. And I'm like, no, Daenerys killed Viserys. All right. If Daenerys had said, no, don't kill him, you know, maim him yeah. or whatever, that probably would have been the case. Um, but she knew that she was never going to be able to manipulate him in the ways that she would need to in order to get her policies um, at the forefront. And, and Cersei, although resenting that system, um, uses it in a way that works, but kind of doesn't. And she, and it's obvious, like she resents Robert because Robert was she wasn't able to manipulate Robert in a way that got her policies to the forefront. Um, I don't know where I'm going with this, but certainly um, Daenerys and Cersei present to me an interesting contrast of how to deal with the patriarchal system. Um, Sure. Just to build on that, because what's interesting, if you look at the, like, when male characters assume a throne, they're mm -hmm. always doing it sort of in their own right or in their name or the name of their family, right. where all of the women have had to have their bodies somehow exploited by men in order to get the power, the yep. same kind, of, not the same kind of power. So Daenerys was obviously sold off to the Dothraki. Uh, Cersei was basically given to Robert as a consolation prize, as a way to end the war. Uh, Sansa was obviously, you know, her um, was multiple times was attempted to be married off to different men, right. and it, it's sort of through surviving um, those those former husbands um mm -hmm. that it's it's once you've kind of been through it then you have a little bit more autonomy we see that that with that's kind of parallel to what women experienced too in the middle ages that you went from your father's property to your husband's property right and if you were quite lucky and you were forced to marry some old decrepit guy um he died pretty quickly and then you could be 19 and a widow and you'd have some financial freedom yeah that was kind of your best case scenario <laughs> Right. And and that's it very much illustrated in one, you know, one of my favorite um, people in history is Margaret Beaufort, although I found that we, we know we don't know a, a lot, a lot, a lot about her. Um, she, you know, widowed, at, was married off at about nine years old um, to Edmund, uh, I believe is Edmund Lannis, uh, Lannister, um, Edmund Lancaster. Tudor. Tudor, yeah, Tudor. Tudor, Tudor, Tudor. Um, yeah, Jasper's brother. Yep. Right. Half brother of the king from their very mother, good. Catherine of, yeah, who married Henry the fifth. Yeah. See, Dr. Winters. No, that's why Dr. Winters is that's here to make sure, to keep me in line, guys. <laughs> I've literally just been listening to like the history of the Tudors on audiobook in the last two weeks. Otherwise, I would not be that quick off the draw. Oh, hey, <laughs> it's hey. only because <laughs> I haven't. E I I barely even have had time to like look at any anything Tudor related. Like I was supposed to go back and like I'm going to read some Game of Thrones. I'm going to go and I'm going to read some of my you know histories on the Tudors. And I was like but I want to read Herman Melville first. And then, I, and then I got lost in fascism and, oh, it's just been crazy. But, um, it's never enough time for all the books we want to read. Right. Right. And I feel like that twilight episode, I feel like that twilight zone episode where I've lost my glasses. And now oh, yes. I have to, yes. <laughs> now I, the <laughs> <I guess. laughs> and now I have yes. to sit here amongst all these books, but I can't read them. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we're on Margaret Beaufort, Margaret Beaufort. Um, I, Certainly, um, you know, Margaret lived that life of a woman who was, you know, pregnant at 10 years old, ha well, actually pr uh, pregnant at between, I, th I believe, wasn't it 9 and 10? And um, maybe a uh, little... She I was maybe married little... at 12, because that was the minimum age of consent. Yeah, and they normally wouldn't, even in that day, they wouldn't get a girl pregnant that early because they knew the health risks. But because he was, Edmund was going off to war and they wanted to make sure that they could claim her property, he... Basically, yeah, sort of um, statutory rape or raped, yeah, whatever right. you want to call it. However, it basically was sexual assault because she was underage, even though she was married. Anyway, um, yeah, she I delivered when she was thirteen. Right. It was. Um, yeah. uh, she she lived that life, and she and we and and in, in her story is the culmination of kind of the best case scenario, right? Um, and I think there's that parallel with Cersei where, you know, unlike Margaret, she kills her husband and she tries with Joffrey to assume power. She fails. And then she gets kind of the golden son um, in Tommen and she, and particularly in the books, 
um, is having a very lovely time up until the time in which she is caught by the faith in ruling in Tommen's name and in actually getting to live her dream of, okay, I have the power. Tommen is a young boy. He is not fit to rule for himself. He's making decisions. You know, he's ready to outlaw beats, all right, because he doesn't like mm -hmm. them. So um, he, she is finally kind of living her dream. And definitely in season six, you know, we see at the end of six that she is, she's on the throne. Um, and and I, damn, I, is she fierce. Right? <laughs> so I was like, wow, like she puts on this dress. I oh. was like, oh, she's getting ready for something. I she's knew, <laughs> right? When I when when the when the episode 10 opens and she is in that dress, I was like, she's not going to that freaking trial. There is no way she no, no, looks no. that good and she's <laughs> going to this trial. No, 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 honey. It's a we, war costume. That's right? she's going into battle. <laughs> and I, I I'll admit, I said this on Twitter and I, I admit it to you and anyone else who wants to know, I oftentimes will stand by my bedroom window with a glass of, of fruit juice because I don't drink like that. <laughs> you know, cold yeah. fruit juice in a wine glass, stirring it around, thinking about you know, bearing <laughs> and them just, you know, sipping back and okay, what what can we do? Right. I'm I'm game of thronesing in real life. That's the, that's the sad part. <laughs> if only I had dragon fire. Right. <laughs> if I had a dragon, it would be if I had a dragon, that's what that's when yeah. the world would stop. A world economy would just be everyone would just be in silence waiting for the day that I flew over with my Valyrian steel sword and, and this, this time it's you. <laughs> um but uh, ultimately I guess my point is that Cersei Cersei's traditionalist path um, in the books, and I think I think it'll happen in the books and certainly in the show, has led her to a more feminist path where she now has to be the rule. She has to have the agency. She has to make the decisions. And she's no longer in a position of, well, the king says, or the king would like you to do. She is now the, the authority. And I, I'm eager to see how she handles that because she has so been trained to you know manipulate men to um say that the king wants x or the queen you know the king wants x or the king is going to do x um i'd like to see how she deals with having the power and that responsibility herself against daenerys who for a long time in both the series and in the books has had that autonomy has had that power for herself and has had to take the responsibility of her decision it, it, it being her decisions that are criticized and questioned and um dealt with as opposed to her having to to play the puppeteer behind a king or some man um yeah on the cersei topic you know she's basically had her whole life where she's had her her blonde beautiful brother right and she's banging um <laughs> You know who was always you know her the the apple of her father's eye and then even before um her i mean even being like a second child i think um that uh um uh, Tyrion is the youngest he's still a male yeah so even if he's a dwarf he's still a male so he still gets precedence before her and you're right now uh, um uh <laughs> she is at the point where her father's dead her brother is physically maimed and her younger and, and Tyrion is out of the country and an accused murderer. And it, right. that's what it took for her to be. And, <laughs> and she's lost two chill, two boys you know, running the throne. And all of that had to happen for her to get to her point because it's, her sex has been holding her back her entire life. Yeah. And yeah. In the books, it's really, you know, what I find what I found most interesting was that in the books, she and Jamie used to switch places all the time. And so she had learned from his master at arms. She had kind of learned how to fight and the value of that. And I what bothers me kind of about the Game of Thrones universe, particularly with women, is you know, we learned from medieval history that kidnapping a woman is like is standard practice. That's standard operating procedure. If if um, you are in a situation where um, you can kidnap a woman, you should, right? Particularly if she's of the blood royal. Um, if you can hold a woman hostage, you should. If she's, you know, if she has, she because she has some value to her family. Um, and what I'd never liked about Eddard Stark, and kind of one of the reasons I, ro I rooted for his death, was he, his own sister had been, ki quote unquote, kidnapped by Rhaegar, yet he didn't find the value in teaching his daughters how to fight. Right. Because and I, I didn't understand that. I still don't understand that. You're you're you have to learn to fight to kind of ward off things like that. And Lord Eddard was just like, nah, 
I, you've all, you know, my own sister only you got kidnapped. You're a lady of a manor. Right? You can give the lady of a manor. Yeah, and the wildlings are a complete opposite, right? If you want to yeah. look at a contrasting uh, social setup, yeah, there, like, if you want to have sex with a woman, you kind of, like, got to um, beat her. Not, like, physically beat her, but you have yeah, to show. You're, yeah, because if you can't overpower her, that's, like, a criterion, like, you know, like, swipe to the left. Um, right. <laughs> right. So, you know, yeah, that kind of um, option would have been open, but, you know, with the whole emphasis on chivalry, that, too, that idea of chivalry requires women to be infantilized in order yeah. for men to protect them but yeah that's a good point that that they're the starks are far more bound up and of course you know with uh with caitlin uh she's got uh catlin sorry um you know she's the real uh, almost epitome of that you know she gave up her family went to live in the north and never really felt accepted and gave birth to all these children and watched her husband die and then watched her children die and then watched her children's children die in front of her right. uh, she was just a completely tragic character a woman who did everything right and yet everything went wrong yeah and uh, one thing about Catelyn Tully is that you know she is this I, I love Jamie's line about you know comparing her with Cersei um in six when he's talking to Edmure um she is she is a woman who upholds the the medieval order she's a woman who totally um you know who teaches sansa how to be a a young woman to the extent that she can um and how to deal with the social order of the day um and she does everything right she negotiates with renly she she attempts to reconcile renly and stannis she um tries to give her 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 son the best counsel she can um but at the end of the day um she is unable to to resurrect her family to keep her family from falling apart and it's it's tragic to a certain extent i mean i i've certainly had arguments with people about how i feel about catlin tully um and Part of me, you know, feels for her, and part of me is just like, there are so many other things you could have done. <laughs> yeah. um, but ultimately, she she too kind of reminds. I always call it the old way or the old order. She too is of the old order of things where women have a particular role; they play out that role. And I, I almost, you know, I almost view it kind of from Tywin's perspective of you, if you're going to win the Game of Thrones, you have to bend the rules. And that means changing up how you view your role, changing up how you do things. I mean, the Red Wedding is the epitome of that. The Red Wedding completely changes the rules about guest right and how you are to yeah. handle, right, certain situations. Um, mm -hmm. And in that moment tywin wins the game of thrones right he eliminates a major enemy um in one foul swoop without really having to take credit for it and i i feel for the starks because they weren't they didn't kind of have that treachery or that knowledge of the game especially um Catelyn Tully, who I think is going to be contrasted by Sansa. I think Sansa has that knowledge of how the game is played, how to change the rules um and I think that Sansa's journey is going to be one that is going to be interesting to contrast with with um, her mother's. Because Definitely. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no, no, no. Honey, <laughs> cut me off. <laughs> no. right? Well, just to reinforce that, yeah, because Sansa is really the, what you would call the, the archetypal princess character. Right. right? The eldest daughter, she's going to be married to a prince, um, and she's probably had the least amount of agency of anybody in the stories. And as you were talking before, I was reminded of that line by um, uh, Tyrion that I have, a, I have a soft spot for cripples, bastards, and broken things. <laughs> and that's kind of who is winning by the end of season six. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, the people who are not the traditional story heroes. You yeah. do have, you know, you've got Tyrion, you've got Bran, who is physically a cripple. You have, um, uh, you know, John, who's a bastard. Uh, Daenerys, who's an orphan. Um, you know, and so, and Arya, who's, I mean, there's a lot of orphan kids. But oh yeah, it's never, you know, if you think of the traditional storybook stories like, you know, Shrek or any of the Disney stuff, nobody who's competing in the 
in the closing season of of Game of Thrones looks like any of those characters we're used to seeing. And that's what I think Martin does the best. I mean, he's coming from a male perspective and he's going to, you know, there's a thing, he, he probably puts in things like brothels and women as sex workers without too much thought because it's a bit of world building. Yeah. But he does, to his credit, he writes really interesting female characters. And he because does. they are acting outside of the normal bounds we don't know what to expect and not knowing what to expect makes it more exciting oh yes and i i appreciate his female characters uh quite a bit i i love the dune series that's one of my favorite that's probably not even one of my that is my favorite of all of the book series i love dune is my favorite by um frank herbert and i i often compare the two and i find that the roles for women in Dune and the roles for women in Game of Thrones are quite similar in that they start off, it, for many women, they start off in the more traditional realms of political society, but then something, but then things start to go wrong. And the way that women handle those issues becomes very interesting because they have to rely on their training, their wits, what they know, their sexuality, um, in order to advance their position. And I, you know, in building on your point, I think that there are of course there are misogynist elements in game of thrones you can't escape that um but to see um a woman like Den to see aria i think aria is probably the best example for me of a young woman who has escaped this royal game and is going to change the way that the game is played because she now has the power of violence um yeah we haven't even got to aria yet but that's going right, to be an exciting conversation <laughs> right um I think that, and and Daenerys, you know, I, I think that one thing that that con that that connects kind of Dune and Game of Thrones is women who have gained the power of violence and how they wield that power um, in a patriarchal world. Daenerys is who she is in part because she has these war machines that are loyal to her, more loyal to her than any any human will ever be. Um, and she herself is a war machine. She herself escaped from a fire, you know, and in, of course in season yep. six, she, she starts yeah. the fire, right? Right. One of, I mean, arguably one of my favorite scenes in television history is when she walks out of that, that temple and it's, it's like, yes. Yeah. It's so visually profound. You, yeah. It's just like, you know exactly how to interpret it and you're just overawed by it. And you're like, ah, it's a dragon queen. Where do I bow down before her? Right, right. <laughs> and, and and I love that, you know, I was so ready for one of the dragons to come and swoop in and, you know, and save her life or burn down the calls or whatever. What I loved about it was this was Daenerys's power. This was her own um, ability. This wasn't, she wasn't relying on anyone. This was about her and her right. doing something on her own. And I think that that was, that was, that's where a lot of the profundity comes in for me is this is a woman who's using her own agency, her own ability to her own guile to get herself out of a majorly fucked situation. Um, and I, I identify a lot with Daenerys. Um, I've had certainly an abusive past and been in abusive relationships and um, was kind of a timid person and to see her journey um, and a kind of mirroring my own. I'm not saying I'm a dragon queen or anything, but to see I'll say it. <laughs> You're a dragon queen. Well, thank you. Um, to see her journey um, gives me, you know, not it gives me some strength and hope um, sure. for other young women. Um, that they'll see, you know, Game of Thrones and they'll, and for them, they'll, they'll understand the kind of underlying message of you, you can escape these relationships, not necessarily by killing your spouse or by killing, you know, the, the, your abusive partner, but, but, but you can escape and you can still have a life that's fruitful and have agency and autonomy and be a happy person and have authority and do what you want to do with your life. Um, yeah, and she, and you know, one of the difference, a big difference, big difference between the book and the TV shows, of course, is the age of all of these characters. Right, right. The, because we meet them as teens, yeah. basically, young teens. Um, and so they're much more of children coming into their own. And that, so the arc is greater. You know, they mature and they go through these formative experiences and they adapt and they change. And they have to, and, and kind of, you know, people who can't be political, like her brother, get weeded out. <laughs> right. You know? So, um, yeah, and she um, moves from sort of, you know, being the wife of the the 
Cal to, you know, having the dragons as her power to mm -hmm. going to Car um, Kath, Karth, what is it? Karth. Kath, Karth, yes. Um, and then see, being played around and establishing her own authority and then actually getting the Unsullied. And again, she's kind of going from army to army, but I felt like by season six, she's more wielding her own authority. Yeah, I, I totally agree course with that. Of it. I, I, not to cut you off, I, to I, I agree <laughs> with that totally. She's... Um, in in Karth, she's sort of, and I just saw season two and read a bit and read um, a few chapters from Clash of Kings recently, and she's definitely kind of begging up her own army in Karth or attempting to, and she learns the lesson that okay, you know what, people don't give you anything. You've got, and no matter what you have, you know, you she has dragons. She has the most priceless thing on earth, right? No one's giving her anything. But she kind of realizes that no one's going to give me anything. I'm going to have to take it with my own guile and my own uh, and my own thoughts. And I love to see, you know, this woman who probably in the books by the time she gets to Astapor is 16, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I know she's 14. She's 14 when Khal Drogo dies. So, um, yeah, very young in the books. Right. And right. for her to to have tricked Krasnus um, out of this army and out of a translator, um, right. which I, 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 <laughs> that I, was great. I, right. I mean, that's, that's one of my, that's everyone's favorite moment. I love that moment um, when she just whoops around and, and starts speaking Valyrian and everyone's like, Oh, what? And it's like, you didn't recognize that she had all the Valyrian tra Like you just want to slap Krasnus and then like, come on, bro. She looks Valyrian, whatever. But um, yeah, the arrogance of people toward foreigners, foreigners assuming right? things about foreigners, you right? Know? And and that women, right? And that's one of the things you know that she is the simpering. You know, he calls her, oh, what a simpering mule this one is. It's like, dude, this woman could kill you and about fifty other people, and she's going to. Um, I I think that 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 moment is the moment where all the expectations really start to change about who Daenerys is and what she's capable of. It's not just that, oh, here's a young girl and she has these war machines, she has these dragons who are also, you know, her children in some regard. They love her and she loves them. Um, now it's a matter of, and not to mention in the book, she's obviously having these prophetic dreams as well. Um, this is now a woman who is a military leader and is, and obviously a tactician smart enough to have done something that I don't think that Tywin or um, especially Tywin, I don't think that Tywin could have pulled off what Daenerys pulled off and asked the poor because Daenerys has grown up her basically her entire life as a poor kid living on the streets. Um, she learned how to eat and how to survive in a world where she was a beggar and her and her brother, you know, lived on the streets for many years um, in the free cities. And, I don't think that Tywin Lannister, who had lived his whole life as a wealthy man, um, could have made the same kind of tactical decision that Daenerys made when she decided, okay, I'm going to give you this dragon. Not. Psych. Um. <laughs> right. I don't know if you, do you know the Gay of Thrones? No. What is that? Oh my gosh. You have to watch it. Uh, they start, usually, I think they start about season three, unfortunately, or about halfway through two, but it's a, a guy who's a hairdresser out in LA and he brings in a client. He's like, oh my God, did you see the last Game of Thrones? And then he talks you through the episode and they show little clips, but he's got nicknames for everyone. So mm -hmm. like Grey Worm is baby Barack Obama <laughs> and Cersei is blonde Cher and Daenerys is Christina Aguilera. <laughs> And in the scene where um, she's negotiating, you know, for the Unsullied and she just has the dragon, you know, and then she stands there with the whip. And then you just want to hear Whitney Houston going, I'm every woman. <laughs> and then they put the music on to Daenerys, you know, like the flames going up in the background. And yeah, so yes. after this, go check out The Gay of Thrones. It's delightful. And it's a great sort of recap and reinterpretation of the episodes. Uh, so lots and lots of fun. Awesome, awesome. I cannot wait. The one person yeah. I have to talk about who is my favorite character is Melisandre. Okay, because she's quite a... Why is she your favorite character? I'm interested in that. She is my favorite character because all the character because all the female characters effectively come from a position of power. Even Daenerys, who is an orphan, whose family is out of power, she's still a Targaryen. 
Um, Melisandre for me is the only person who comes from absolutely nothing, who comes from the bottom cast. And that is she's, she was a slave prior to um, being um, sold to the church. And I appreciate kind of for the same reason I appreciate Daenerys is that Melisandre has her own power. Um, although we don't kind of know what her relationship to the church is or how the church or how um, the church influences their, their magic or the people who have magic um, who right. are priests and priestesses. Um, Melisandre is not reliant on a family name in order to intimidate people, in order to gain access into powerful families' homes. Um, she is able to seduce Stannis and um, create an army of followers, the Queensmen in the books, um, and convert, um, what's her name? Selyse, um, uh, Stannis's wife and all of these things on her own, without the backing of the church, without there being you know, people to help her. Um, she makes these incredible feats. It is directing policy um, for Stannis on her own, right? Without, without dragons, without um, any external force helping her. And I find that, and as a per, you know, and as a person kind of the descendant of slaves, um, I sort of feel like, yeah, this is a woman who came from the bottom caste and is now at the highest caste, partially because of the church, but partially because of her own power. And I appreciate that about her. I appreciate that she doesn't feel a loyalty to House Baratheon or to um, House Lannister or to any of the particular houses. She, her only, um, loyalty is to her god is to her church um and i i definitely appreciate that about her um right. i know that she's she's wrong you know there's a lot mm -hmm. of there's a lot of moral there's in terms of who melisandre is and how she deals with moral situations she's immoral um uh, to hell like she's practically evil um but I, I appreciate that everything that she does, she does because she has faith in her God that has given her this life that has helped her to live these several centuries and what have you. Um, I don't know if that's a good reason or not, but I love hey, it. It's subjective, you know, it's it's art. So, you know, I don't think there's a right and wrong. I just think there are different takes and I think yeah. different takes are interesting because for me, it's, um, it's definitely Arya. Oh, well, you know, uh, Arya's, my, yeah, like her chapters are the ones I savor. And I think it's because what I appreciate about Arya's character so much is that from a very early age, she knows that she's not been born to the right position in life. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think about the TV show and she's still with her dad and Ed says, you know, someday you'll be a, a lady of a, of a house and you'll have sons and daughters. And she goes, that's not me. Yeah. You know, from a very early age, she always she knew there was a truth to her that she was willing to listen to. And um, the way that she's had to scrape and scrap and fight and um, also make alliances and friends and yeah. to be very political. Like when she's with um, the mountain, not the mountain, sorry, the, ho uh, the hound. Yeah. Yeah, when she's with the hound. Sorry. Um, it's been a while since I've watched them. So I've it's fine. Them but you, you heard what I meant. Yeah. And feel free to correct me always. Um, but, uh, you know, they end up forming a kind of grudging bond. And mm -hmm. she works that for as long as it's advantageous. And then when it's no longer advantageous, she moves on. You know, she's, yeah. um, she's learning how to live in that world at that time, which is survival. Um, oh. So, yeah. And, you know, of course, her whole experience in the House of, <laughs> the house house of Black and White. And white right. Is there, is there a store in the States called, like, the Black and White Market or the Black Market or something? Because they call, they call, they make reference to that shop or something in the Game of Thrones. But anyway. Um, and, I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> and anyway, it's quite funny, no matter, I think, whether you get it or not, because it just sounds like a place, like, pure one sort of right. crate and barrel place. Anyway, um, yeah, and so she really, she throws away her, her, well, she doesn't really, she keeps needle, but she sort of sheds a lot of what it meant to be a Stark and the privilege of that and tries mm -hmm. to make it on her own merit. Um, and then, of course, you know, she's also discovering her, her own code and her own morality. So like Melisandre, you know, she's been doing some pretty not 
moral stuff. You know, she's on a vengeance, you know, war. Oh, yeah. She's out yeah. to kill people. I was I was talking to my mom because you know I got my mom addicted to Game of Thrones. No, um, no. <laughs> I can bond over that. Like right? chat about it. <laughs> and she was like, Well, I don't know how I feel about Arya killing Walder Frey. And I was like, listen, um, you put me in that circumstance, and this is a man who killed my mother and my brother and potentially my, you know, cousin or cousin or nephew or niece. Um, yeah, and and people that I know and love, yeah, I'm a I'm a want revenge, mom. Mm-hmm. Um, I I love Arya. I love Arya because because of of course because she is a woman who very much early on, you know, from the first episode really where she where Bran and the boys are are shooting arrows and she's sitting there sewing and is pissed off about it and doesn't mm-hmm. sew very well. Um, and she and she hits that and she hits that that mark and she is like. Yeah, that's me, boys. That this is what I do. Um, drop the mic. Yeah, I'm walking away now. <laughs> right? Drop, <laughs> like drop the bow and arrow like the mic. Boom. Yeah. Um, that's how you from do. right from that moment, um, we know Arya is going to be a woman who doesn't who defies the the social order, who doesn't mm-hmm. care about being a lady, who doesn't care about you know holding. We don't know that she doesn't care about holding on to a hold fast. Um, but because oh, she, when she's talking to Ned, she says, "Well, can I be Lord of a Holdfast?" Because she wants that power right. for herself. Um, right. I, I love the moments. In fact, that's my. This is my backup channel, and one of the um, one of the things I named myself was Lummy after the, one of the characters that travels with her and Gendry and Hot Pie, um, and I, that relationship that she has with Lummy and Gendry and Hot Pie mm-hmm. is to me endearing, but is also a sign of who she is. She's a woman who not only can attempt to politic with the big hobnobs, but she's a woman, she's a young lady, I should say, who can inspire the people, the downtrodden, the, you know, the boys who are being sold off to the Night's Watch. Um, She can forge alliances with them. And I think in a world where you know, society is so stratified between the very wealthy and the very poor. Um, her crossing that boundary to me is interesting um, in a way that nobody else really does. Yeah, um, and your your point about basically, you know, her family almost being wiped out. I don't, to her, I guess she knows, you know, Sansa is still alive, but I don't think she knows that, that anybody else is alive. Um, you know, that uh, anyone who's experienced death, you know, one of the things that one way people can process it is by making it making you hard and emotionally mm-hmm. distant and i think you see the cumulative effect of loss on aria she becomes yeah. harder and harder you know she becomes more and more ruthless um as a sort of a coping mechanism to deal with the amount of grief and i think she's an interesting contrast to another woman who had a i think a very deep sense of herself and that's of course brianna of tarth yes but she's on the complete opposite side of Arya, right? She believes in honor and duty and commitment and protecting, mm-hmm. you know, all the sort of chivalrous code right. th- um, ways of, of being. And, and whereas, you know, um, Arya is more like the the rogue in D&D, you know, sort of like <laughs> the thief slash assassin character, you know, right. because of the experiences that her life have set, have put her the path that she's been put on. But they're both women who don't fit the world they're meant to be in, in the way that say Sansa fits it easily and Cersei was forced into it. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's an interesting contrast between the, the kind of character who is willing, who is willing to forego social acceptance in order to pursue what they know is their own truth, mm-hmm. but in two very different ways. Um, and then the character, the female characters who basically try to work within the male system like Cersei and Sansa Right. And um, I don't really know where Daenerys falls in that because she's she kind of is in both camps a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I think that Daenerys sort of is is the third way, if you will, between between those characters who are subverting the male system and those characters who are trying to live within it and trying to gain their power through it. Um, and that's what makes you know Daenerys so interesting. I mean that that is what to me what makes Game of Thrones so interesting is just how it, we could talk for years just about how women in this universe 
um, find their way and how they deal with certain situations. I, I mean, I could, I could talk about it. I could talk about Game of Thrones forever. Like, um, I don't think my boyfriend and I would have much of a relationship. I would say this to him. I'm like, <laughs> I don't. I say this to him all the time. I'm like, listen, I don't know. I know that Game of Thrones is like the crux of our relationship. And I feel like if we don't have that, we ain't going to stay together. And he's like, so so what, you don't love me now? It's like, I still love you, but, you know, I love Game of Thrones. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, well, we can talk about it, too, because you're right. I mean, the depth of it is, is crazy because the other the character that kind of popped up in my head is, I can't remember her name, but Theon's sister. Yara Asha. Oh, my God, does she kick ass. Right? Oh, my God. And she's a woman who's like sort of, again, you know, lower level nobility, you know, her house is the ruling house, but it's a minor house in terms of power in the, in the Game of Thrones. Right. Um, but she's stepped into a traditionally male role and won it on male terms. And because uh -huh. she's also a lesbian, she gets to do the same thing as men. So she's less conspicuous than yeah. a straight woman would be in the same situation. And I think that's an interesting character to develop in that world but also kind of yeah the the, it, the kinds of themes and ideas that it explores about the way that she fits in and tries to be one of them in the way that the women aren't trying to be like the men um right. in the rest of the the rest of the characters we've talked about yeah, I think that her, especially the fact that, you know, she's a lesbian, which I'm like, ooh, can I get with Yara? You know, I'm I'm pan, I'll get with Yara. Um, we, I, I love the, I, of that moment where she's sitting in Volantis with Theon and they're having this discussion about, you know, hey, if you want to end it, just end it, you know, and I can go home, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't have to do this. Um, I, I loved, I love Yara because, as, as you said, she, uh, and I totally agree, as you said, she's won this position on, you know, male terms. And um, she's not, you know, wearing a dress. She's not, she doesn't have to seduce a man. You know, she doesn't have to do the things that a woman like Cersei or Daenerys has to do to gain power. She she won it through battle. And that's one thing I think I, lo I love about the Ironborn a little more than almost any other house is that I don't know that House Lannister or really any other, any other group would have allowed a woman to rise that far based upon her abilities as a reaver or a raper or a you know, warrior or what have you. Even um, Selwyn Tarth, you know, um, um, Brienne's dad, doesn't necessarily, you know, you don't get the sense that he approves right. of Brienne's journey. Right, exactly. But, yeah, I agree. But um, you you know that Balon is like, yeah, this is, you know, your, her brothers are dead. It's her job to assume their role. And I think there's something interesting and almost feminist going on with the Ironborn, but we kind of, we, we have to take that different track with Euron. Um, and I think in seven and in season seven and eight, we'll see um, whether or not the Ironborn are a more feminist house than some of the other houses. Um, I would say that the most feminist house, obviously, to me, is House Martell. Um, the Dornish seem to be the most the most feminist, the most uh, willing to accept women for who they are and to allow women to take positions of power without it being a matter of sexuality of, or using your sexuality um, just as... Um, just because that is oft has been their way, they were founded by a woman. Their strongest leaders have been women, so um, they are a lot less to me, a, a bit less sex. Maybe not a lot, a lot, but a bit less sexist than other houses. And I think the Ironborn are too. I think that in a situation where they could have easily said, "Where's Euron?" or in the books, "Where's Victorian?" or "Where's you know, um, where are the brothers to Balon to rule the Iron Islands?" Um, I think that. The Ironborn didn't have to accept Yara, but they did because she is the epitome of what what they expect out of an Ironborn to be a reaper, to be a raper, to be to take your salt wives and to uh, take what is yours with the Iron Price. Yeah, and to get back, well, a little bit to history, you know, it was also Theon who said, you know, it's Yara who should be, you know, the the leader, and that was an important moment because it was a validation from a man of a woman right. ruling. And in, in, if, since you like sort of, you know, uh, British or English history, I really think there's a big comparison to be made between Queen Elizabeth I and Mary, Queen of Scots, in that Elizabeth was surrounded by counselors who were loyal to her. Mm -hmm. 
had Walsingham, she had um, Burley, she had uh, Dudley, you know, she had a whole bunch of men who were committed to her reign, whereas right. Mary ran Scotland, which was just a bunch of feuding Highland <laughs> Lowland um, lords and lairds and um, guys who had blood feuds going back, you know, the Hamiltons hated the whatever and yeah. the Stuarts and all that. And they were all of her counselors were basically using her to try to get something else, whether it was Darnley trying to get the throne, uh, the, the crown matrimonial, or mm -hmm. her father-in-law, you know, trying to, you know, wield his, you know, get his way in, or her, her half-brother, who was a, oh, no, sorry, he was a bastard, and that that's why he couldn't rule Scotland and always sort of resented it. And, mm -hmm. and so her reign was much less successful, uh, mostly because the, the men around her didn't recognize her authority. And Elizabeth's did, and it led to a much stronger country, and obviously a, a queen who reigned for 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 a very long time. And we have an age now named after her. Mm -hmm. So you know, with um, the Yara thing, compared to like what Cersei's trying to do in um, in uh, blah 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 blah. What's the name? Um, King's Landing. Yeah. Um, you know, the, uh, Cersei will doesn't have necessarily a foundation of acceptance for her rule the way Yara was trying to stand on her a meritocracy basically that the right. ironborn was that they were responding to up until the moment that that uh Euron yes. showed up right um and I, I I agree I think that Cersei Cersei's going to have a much tougher time because not only is she now no longer in control of several kingdoms but she's never had that sort of support um, that uh, that Elizabeth the first had. She's never had that sort of. She didn't have loyal male counselors either in the book or in the series. She's definitely always been a character whom um, men have either tried to use or to get around. Um, right. It's you know, especially with her with her uncle Kevin. Um, my my own pet theory has always been that Cersei should have locked all of her family up into into one of those black cells and said, "Listen, these kids are me and Jamie's kids." That's what it is. Oh, yeah, that would have been an interesting power play. Oh, yeah, tell um, Tywin. I think Tywin, yeah. I always thought Tywin kind of knew, but I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll save that way. for our theory talk. Yeah, but yeah, I guess you could compare Daenerys and her loyal uh, advisors, the Elizabeth, to Cersei's Mary, Queen of Scots, in right. that, you know, now she's got, um, she's got Tyrion, she's got Lord Friendzone, um, that's the name that, that's from Game of Thrones, Lord Friends. Anna. No, no, it wasn't. It was from um, it was from not Cinema Sins, but the other one, Screen Junkies. I think their their box set review of Game of Thrones. Yeah. Uh, and you know, Grey Worm and, and her translator and all these people and um, the Spider now too is on her side. Yeah. So she's got all of the loyal counselors um, around her united. Uh, yeah. Going into into yeah going into battle yeah. and and um i think that and yeah and your comparison is certainly apt and accurate you know me i'm i'm all over the place with this but um when it's game of thrones I'm fun honey, I'm <laughs> all over, right i'm um, just that, enjoying the chat <laughs> right that's the fun of it we're just having a fun talk about some yeah. game of thrones um but when it comes to cersei and we all know how much i love her um, she at this moment, Cersei's only two loyal counselors are Jamie, whom we don't know actually where his allegiance lies, um, and um, Kyburn, who has always been just obsequious and not necessarily um, a clear thinking person. You know, he's a person who's always wants to serve Cersei, and we don't know that his counsel is is right because right. he is blinded by his his kind of brown nosing <laughs> mm -hmm. um i think that you know kind of a prediction for seven is that cersei is going to have a really hard time um getting you know even though she is the queen and i will give it to her in my mind um legally quote unquote there's no one else of the blood royal if you will to rule right jamie jamie is in a lot of ways been emasculated by um him losing his sword hand right and um i and no one you know because of the kind of reaction that people had when he killed the mad king nobody really is going to take jamie for their king um mm -hmm. and 
and there's no one else. You know, the Robert's family is his immediate family is dead. Um, so the, there really isn't anyone else of the of the line to take over but her, and she's the firstborn child of Tywin Lannister. Yeah, um, and I guess the former queen and the mother of two kings. <laughs> so kind right? of, but yeah, it's yeah, kind of a weird basis of claiming power. But I don't know what they'll have for precedent or history there, or okay. she'll just do it by conquest. Well, and and by conch, she blew up the damn sept. She should. I mean, I'm sorry if you if you make that type of polit. I mean, that type of terrorism is yeah. something that and it and it was an act of terrorism. I, I we don't kind. I've seen a lot of like videos about it certainly um, because I just love seeing her blow up that sept. Um, <laughs> and one person we haven't actually gotten into was Marjorie. Yeah, yeah, I was also thinking that, but yeah, we can talk about Marjorie too. Yeah, um, but uh, getting back to Cersei and we have blowing up the sept and her terrorism. Her terrorism. She, to me, that is a Tywin esque move. It's messy mm -hmm. and it's not, it doesn't have the compact neatness that Tywin had with his, you know, political terrorism via the Red Wedding um, or, Eve, or, or that little finger in Olena had via the Purple Wedding. Um, but it shows um, not just to me a level of viciousness that Cersei obviously had, but a level of cunning that Cersei, that we didn't think Cersei kind of possessed. Right. You know, Cersei's always been chided as having low cunning or of being of kind of average intelligence, even though Tyrion tries to say, well, you know, I think you have above average intelligence. People often treat her like she's got average intelligence. So here's a moment where we, you know, you might not agree, you might be angry with her, but you can't deny that in this act of terrorism, she has committed probably one of the greatest acts of terrorism in their whole, in the entire history of their, uh, of the King's Landing of the Seven Kingdoms. Because in one foul swoop, she eliminated all of her political enemies, basically, except Elena. Um, and she, it neatly sewed up this package that she had unleashed on the planet. You know, she'd unleashed the faith militant and she neatly kind of sews that all up along with her, the Tyrells and Kevin Lannister and anyone who was standing in her way um, and is able to take the throne via conquest. And it's something that I don't know that other people would have thought of or that, um, and I kind of compare, you know, the way that, that some people, rule or don't rule. I don't think it's necessarily something that Sansa would have done or even Arya would have done. I think this is one of the only acts where you can say, okay, this is the demonstration of how intelligent and how cunning Cersei actually can be when she's backed up against a wall, when she doesn't have um, the power, when, when, when it's just Cersei, when she's not, you know, she's not, doesn't have the power of Jaime or Tyrion. This is, this is what she's capable of. And I was proud in that moment. Although I love Marjorie, I was proud. You know, she. Oh, I know. Did it was so own. sad to see Marjorie die. Right, because I. I yeah. mean, well, now, when. Yeah. Go ahead. Go well, ahead. I was just gonna say before on the Cersei thing before we get to Marjorie, because um, okay. we want to do her justice. When you were talking about what Cersei was doing, the image I had in my mind was you know her and the High Sparrow playing chess, and the High Sparrow thinking that he was winning at the game of chess, and then Cersei just standing up and like knocking the board off the right. table. And like kill him. <laughs> <You know? laughs> He's like, what? But I was about to take your queen. <laughs> and and it's like, like no, nope. yeah. Dracarys. Yes. All right. <laughs>